My name is Sajali Williams and I am the SRC for Critical Engagement and Transformation. The idea for tonight's kickoff is a campus-wide discussion about ethical leadership and accountability in society in general and the application thereof to student leadership structures of Stanford University. Now, we live in a country where ethical leadership is a challenge. When we turn on our TV, we turn to our Twitter pages, it's most likely that we're going to see one of our country's leaders behaving or leading in an unethical way. However, this challenge is not limited to government. All sectors of our society, including businesses, sport, academia, are filled with examples of unethical decision making and a lack of accountability. I know it sounds like I'm giving a scolding, I'm not. As students and staff of this university, we are cultivating the future leaders and citizens of our country. Therefore, here on a student leader, on a student level, we need to honestly ask ourselves how we can improve our system such as ARPA, SRC, academic affairs representatives, societies and other leadership structures in terms of effectively being held accountable to their mandates and whether they can do more to demonstrate and promote ethical leadership. It is very easy to point the finger at the rest of society, but remember that when you point a finger at least three fingers point back at us. And therefore, we should shift our focus from contributing, or rather, shift our focus to how we contribute to transforming the atmosphere of ethical leadership and accountability right here on campus in our daily lives. And that is the purpose of this project, to have a critical discussion about solutions to how we can improve systems and protocol, thereby contributing constructively to the national effort of addressing this challenge. Now with tonight's event, we're not going to go as in-depth and so close to home. Tonight we'd like to kick off this project by talking about accountability in the different aspects of our society in general. During the rest of the semester, there will be follow-up discussions in the different student leadership bodies of the campus, where issues such as ethical leadership and accountability will be applied to and discussed in specific student leadership contexts. For example, there will be a discussion focusing on ARPA and there will be a separate discussion focusing on the SRC, etc. There's also a blog competition that has opened today on which you can go and express your thoughts and opinions on this matter. And there will be cash prizes awarded to the best contributions. The cash prizes are worth 1,000 rand and 500 rand respectively. So get your blogging on. The tangible outcome of this project is a document that summarizes all comments and ideas gathered from the student unions, outlines a list of values that need to be entrenched in our leadership structures, and suggests a way forward for the implementation of these ideas and values. This document will serve as a guideline for collective action in future. Tonight's kickoff is sponsored by Unashamedly Ethical. And this project is a partnership between the Student Representative Council, the Prim Committee, societies, <coughs> clusters, the Freedom and Sales of an Institute for Leadership Development, Demarty, Bonfire, and Unashamed Now, because I'm sure you're all tired of my voice, I'll now hand over to Jacques van Royen, the Ambassador of Unashamed to give us a brief description of their campaign and what they are doing. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sasha. Um, it's just awesome um, <clears throat> to experience uh, a full hall like this. Is just awesome, and I, I thank everyone, the whole partnership for what they've done to get all the people and all the students here and to get the excitement going. Um, Unashamedly Ethical uh, was a movement that started in 2006 with a man the name of Graham Power from Power Construction. Um, he got a vision about uh, being unashamedly ethical uh, by traveling, he's in, he's in the construction industry, and, um, and he just saw the 
poverty and bribery and corruption, not only in South Africa, but throughout the world. And, um, you know, bribery and corruption is the uh, most significant contribution to people that are poor and live in uh, impoverished countries. So in 2010, this uh, uh, movement was officially launched and um, I, I was lucky enough to be asked by Graham to be one of the ambassadors for Unashamedly Ethical uh, just, to, uh, just to be an ambassador, just to market the whole thing of Unashamedly Ethical. And um, what we've done in the last and achieved in the last few years and if you've read lately all the, uh, all the papers and in the media about bribery and corruption and about CEOs that are non-existent of big companies, CEOs, we believe, I would like to believe, that the awareness campaign and the mission of the ethical started in 2010 was, was hugely responsible for, um, for bringing people into that space of um, ethical leadership. And uh, what we've achieved until now was that uh, there's more than 23,000 signatories in South Africa. Those are individuals that through breakfast and through an awareness campaign and, uh, you know, by word of mouth, people have decided to stand up and sign a form and stand for certain meetings. And I'll go through the list quickly after I give you the stats. There's more than 5,000 organizations who have signed it as an organization. Um, there's 37 countries in Africa that where there's representatives or signatures in 37 out of the just over 50 countries. Uh, Graham's just returned from Jamaica where the, the majority of the Jamaican government has signed the Unashamedly Ethical Code and there's more than 400 signatories coming from Jamaica. So we've also moved internationally. In Malaysia, there's uh, almost 4,000 uh, signatories. In the USA, almost 700. In Kenya, more than 500. And as I said, in Jamaica, there's more than 400. Now, it's easy to sign a form, but and then forget about it. And what sort of a, a accountable system is there? But we also have that. We've got an ombudsman. We've got a structure in place where if you've signed the form and you behave unashamedly ethical, then you know you, you could be held accountable. And so it's not just a thing that you sign and forget about it. You, there's an accountable structure. And I'm not going to talk too much about that. that at the moment, the, the organization or the movement has got a few people that's working on a full-time basis, but mostly um, it's, uh, it's voluntary. Uh, I'm a volunteer and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm here in my free time. I've got a different business, but I just see what's happening around me. Um, and I travel through the poor areas every day. And, you know, part of the reason why people are poor is because of unethical behavior. So, uh, uh, there is a system in place. And if I can quickly share with you, just the, the, what we've done is we started with this in 2010. And as it developed about two years ago, we also had a code for, for school children. And um, in my previous job, I was a lecturer at, uh, at this university. And, um, and I always had a, a heart for you. And in some way, there was a gap for me. There was school, we have a code for school children, and we have a code for business people. And in between, there's no code for use. And Sasha has talked about what will happen after this, and we'll focus on what would be the ethical code for you as a student at the University of Stellenbosch. You know, uh, there's a general one, the, the 10 points that's currently there is to be truthful in everything you say, to have faithful to your family relations, to share the interest of others, um, not to accept pay, bribes, and to encourage others not to do the same, to be diligent without being harsh, but be just and fair, to be a peacemaker, to do your work wholeheartedly, <laughs> to submit myself to just and ethical governing authorities, 
to remember the poor by investing generously and sacrificially in the broader community and to collaborate with my peers to impact our community and our nation. And this is the, the current form that is out there for business people. But as a student at the University of Stellenbosch um, and other universities, and before you move into a proper job, what, what would you put into the 10 points of being unashamedly ethical at your age at this university? Is it on to, for instance, take someone else's thesis or piece of or work piece and hand it in? Those are the kind of questions. And we've, we've decided to start off this evening with um, having a discussion around um, accountable leadership. So I'm sure there will be lots of questions afterwards. I, I ask you to ask a lot of questions when the time comes, and I'm really looking forward to this journey. Thank you very much. Paralympics, 
and a gold in 100 meters, gold in 200 meters, um, and world record 2384s. Uh, if only you know what 2384s mean. Um, 2011, um, is that World Cup final? 2011, World Cup Christ Church in New Zealand, 100 meters and 200 meters, uh, both silver, and 400 meters bronze. Once again, in 2011, Funny, funny rights uh, acronyms. Um, AAG Maputo, 200 meters gold, and world record 23 times. 2012 London Paralympic Games, 200 meters. He achieved a sixth place, 100 meters gold, and world record 11. Oh, that's the time. <laughs> and then when I'm finishing, I realize that actually that's the, the record time you have. <laughs> Fanny's hobbies are hiking when he gets the time. His favorite animal is a very serious animal called a chameleon. <laughs> for Jesus. So you were still clapping for funny living for Jesus. Now you are going to clap for giving funny the stage to speak. Just keep in mind that uh, I come from an athletics background and also um, yeah, well, my, my place of influence would also be a Southern church. So that just keep that in mind. Also, while I'm speaking, what is your place of influence? And um, I'm not really going to go into too much of, of um, like the structures that I'm not um, at, like, like the higher structures of of government and things like that, but I'll, I'll, I'll just just um, explain what my experiences are in, uh, and also what you can help you to be more accountable in leadership. So I think um, first of all, it's, it's very important to to have vision in your in your leadership and to get a way to really um, get others to buy into that vision, and then. Because I believe from, from my own experiences that if I can't see the vision and make it my own, then I can't run with the other guys that has that vision. Um, and that's why a team is so important to get a team in. Because um, that also, if, if the good stuff is happening, it's not just one person or a one-man show. It's, it's everyone that, that's on board and, and it also... Um, creates an environment of, or a culture of, of celebration. Um, then secondly, is, is for me, it's relationship building. Um, you know, get to know the guys that you work with, um, you know, in your res or, or wherever you are, and, and see what their strengths are and, and also their weaknesses, and also know what your weaknesses are and your strengths, so that you can, um, when it comes to um, giving out roles and responsibilities that, that they can back you in what your uh, your, your weaknesses are, and then also um, you know, encourage them and, and celebrate them when when the, the, the things are happening. Um, something that's very important for me is, is leaving a legacy. We, um, you know, if you are going to invest in those guys that you are around, and and you actually mentor them. And so that they can um, also be, be leaders again, but also then make other leaders. Then you're going to get into a culture of, of, of leaving a legacy. And even when you're not there anymore, or when, when you're not there for the day, the, the ball will still be rolling. And um, yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's looking into the future. So 
Sorry, I just want to get my spot. And if, if it comes to accountability and, and assessment, uh, I love what my coach did last year at the end of the year. So we have about um, a group of 10 athletes. And what she did is she held a camp for us to, to um, get vision for, for 2015. And then also she asked us the question, what is it that, that we want to portray to the world? What, what's the values that we want to live by? And what's the, the phrase that, that we want to stand for? And um, she even brought in, after we discussed it, she brought in like the whole team, which is um, gym coaches, physios, bios, and even um, you know, the, the partners and spouses, spouses of, of people. And um, we said that the five values that we stand for is accountability, resilience, integrity, excellence, and humility. And how we reflect on that is after every coaching cycle, we'll come together on a, um, you know, around a table and we would um, like say what did it mean for us, like every one of this, this factors, what did it mean for us in the, the cycle? So, and then also, um, how did we experience it? Um, you know, especially like, like, like those five, you, you write it down. Um, what did you experience in that time? And then also, what are the things that, that, you, that you are proud of and, and thankful for, and what can you celebrate? And, and that's really a place where you're not just throwing stuff in the air, you actually come together and, and you keep each other accountable to what you said and what you're going to work on. Um, and, and I really believe it's, it's important to, to focus on, on uh, the progress of, of the guys around you and um, you know, because sometimes when you focus too much on, on the performance, it, it brings, it creates an atmosphere of stress. And um, if you as a leader should, when, when the, um, you know, the stakes are high or, or the tension are high, then you must really create a place where um, you, know, you, you still, even in, in that stressful time, you can, you can portray a, a calm environment and, and a place where um, you, know, you, you still focus on, on what is important um, and, and I believe if you can get to, to a place where you really put out your, your goals and um, your expectations clearly then, then it also gives people confidence um, on what they what, what's expected of them and then lastly and, and this specific um, aspect which is a teachable heart um, it's something that, that I want to work on in my life. It's not something that, that I have under the belt, but, but it's really, and, and in, in this process of thinking about tonight, it's that something that came up. So, yeah, I just want to, want to, want to, I'm not, not saying that I already have it, but it's something that I, I aspire to. And, um, you know, like, if, if you come into a leadership position, who's the guy who was, who was in that leadership position before you? And what can you learn from him? From him? And uh, also, how do you, if you made a mistake, like, are you willing to say, okay, guys, I made the mistake, um, and then, yeah, I'll learn from, from that. And, and the last point on that is to really... Um, Sorry, I know there's another point, I just have to get it. Yeah, how do you how do you handle the, the past experience? Are you are you quick to when there was a quarrel or something bad happened? Are you quick to forgive and, and let it go? Or or do you um, is it a thing that you stuck on and, and you, you can't let it go? Um, and because I experienced it in London twenty twelve, um, I was I was a more of a of a um, you know, experienced athlete and, and the, there was a lot of juniors that came in that year. So it was a lot of new athletes and and one thing um, that happened was I came sixth in the, the two hundred where I where I was the world record all this. It was quite a big shock for me and something that I had to work through. Um, and I remember one athlete said that she's she felt God told her that she must take note because she's going to um, need it. And so what I did was I just realized that I can't do anything about 
that it, well, about the pass, about that 200 meter, like, it's, it's done, it's finished, it's behind me, but I have one thing, and that's to look forward to the, to the 100 meter that's still, um, you know, ahead of me, and so just on, on that note, and that last note is, don't think that past disappointments or failures keep you from, from future victories. Um, yeah, I'll keep that in mind, guys, and then I'll give over to the next. Thank you very much. This seems to be an ever-ready audience. I don't even have to say you can clap me just to it yourself. Let's, let's keep it up in that way. Um, uh, we are going to introduce uh, our next panelist, um, your, your ladyship. The next panelist is uh, Judge Nolwazi Penelope Okwana, who was appointed as a judge of the High Court of South Africa Western Cape Division on the 2nd of December 2013. In early childhood, she dreamt of a career in law. She was, in this respect, uh, greatly influenced by her late father, who would greatly have loved to study law, but lacked the opportunity of doing so. Nolwazi grew up in the Eastern Cape and finished her schooling in a township school called Ikwes Lomso in Sweden, in Port Elizabeth. Having graduated from the University of the Vetwaterstan with a BPro and an LMB degrees, she commenced her articles with a large commercial firm in Johannesburg, formerly known as Dennis Ritz, now known as Norton Rose Group. She was admitted as an attorney in the Transvaal Provincial Division in Victoria. Having qualified as an attorney, she joined a firm in Santin and was involved in labor and commercial law work. She has worked and practiced in the field of law and business for a number of years, mainly in Johannesburg and later in PE. At some stage, she worked as labor law counsel in a mining company, Elder Gold Ashanti, servicing mines as their clients and being involved in the Chamber of Mines. She was a trustee of pension funds and in particular the Mine Workers Provident Fund which she also chaired in early 2000. She served as a director of the Institute of Pension Funds, substitute trustee of the Government Employees Pension Fund, Mine Workers Charitable Trust Fund, amongst others. She is a trustee of Presidomso Alumni Trust Fund. She is passionate about development of women. She was a custodian of Take a Girl Child to Work Web Day initiative by Self C and was involved in a mentorship program of great wealth learners with an organization called Vision for Women in PE. She was also a member of the South African Women Lawyers Association. Prior to her appointment to the bench, she was a director of law of a law firm, TIPA Incorporated and then is based in Johannesburg. She ran the PE branch of the firm and headed its litigation department for a long time before she moved back to join us firm. She acted as a judge both in the labor and in the Western Cape High Court before she was appointed as a judge of the High Court.
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. Decisions of the courts are enormously important 
not only in shaping jurisprudence and creating judicial precedents, but also in affecting the rights of individuals, including their liberty, property, and status. Judges have enormous responsibility. They are able to declare any law or conduct invalid if it is found to be inconsistent with the Constitution. The principle of independent judicial derives from the basic principle of the rule of law, and in particular the principle of separation of powers. Judicial independence denotes freedom of conscience and non-interference in the judge's decision making. Judges should not pay any heed to outside influences such as pressure groups or political parties in performing their functions. Section 165 of the Constitution provides that the courts are independent and subject only to the Constitution and the law, which they must apply impartially, without fear, favor, or prejudice. In fact, judges take an oath of office of or affirmation when they are appointed as judges that they will uphold and protect the Constitution and the human rights entrenched in it and will administer justice to all persons alike without fear, favor, or prejudice in accordance with the Constitution and the law. In terms of Section 165, no person or other state may interfere with the functioning of the courts. There is an obligation placed on the state's organs to protect the courts so as to ensure their independence, dignity, impartiality, accessibility, and effectiveness through legislation and other measures. According to the principle of independence, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary constitute three separate and independent branches of government. The different branches have exclusive and specific responsibilities. By virtue of this separation, it is not permissible for any branch of power to interfere into the other sphere. The principle of separation of powers is the cornerstone of an independent and an impartial judicial system. Judicial independence and judicial accountability have often been perceived as being incompatible. It has, however, been argued that the by many that the judiciary, like any branch of the government, must be accountable directly or indirectly to, to the general public that it serves. The notion that the judiciary needs to be independent from outside sources does not mean that judges are free to behave as they please. A key milestone in the strengthening of independence and integrity accountability of the judiciary in South Africa, and in fact in many countries in the world, was the development and the adoption of the Bangalore Principles of Judicial Conduct in 2002 by the Judicial Integrity Group, a group comprising of heads of judiciaries and judges from throughout the world, including the South African Office of the then Chief Justice. At the time, it was represented by the Deputy Chief Justice Langa, who is now late. In summary, the Bangalore Principles set out six values as a guide to regulate judicial conduct, and the principles are intended as serving as a framework for the development of the codes of conduct by judiciaries in the world. The primary responsibility, however, is to promote and maintain high standards of judicial conduct by every country. In South Africa, the Code of Judicial Conduct was adopted in 2012 in terms of Section 12 of the Judicial Service Commission Act of 1994 as amended. The Code consists of a number of ethical standards, the object of which is to assist the judges on how to deal with ethical and professional issues and to inform the public about the judicial ethos or the very system of the South African judiciary. It deals with judicial independence, propriety, compliance with the law, equality, transparency, fairness of trials or hearings, diligence, restraint, association, recusal, and others and the reporting of inappropriate conduct of the practitioners and the conduct of justice or of judges when they are discharged from service. One of the examples of the ethical issues raised in the code is that of conflict of interest. Article, Article 13 of the 
of the court, for instance, deals with recusal. It provides that a judge must recuse him or herself from a case if there is a real or a reasonable, reasonably perceived conflict of interest or there is a reasonable suspicion of bias. However, a judge must not recuse him or herself on unsubstantiated grounds. For example, a judge may not sit in a matter involving an entity in respect of which he or she sits as a trustee or the director or is a shareholder or there is a member of a family in that matter. Importantly, interest must be dealt with. Conflict of interest must be dealt with adequately and openly and reasons be given for any decision made unless there are exceptional circumstances. The court gives practical guidance on issues like this. Whilst the code is useful, it should not be interpreted as being absolute, precise and exhaustive. Conduct which may appear on a strict reading of the code <coughs> to be permissible might indeed in the, in, in, in the circumstances be unethical and the converse also applies. A law has been done and many, many measures are in place in my view to ensure that there is judicial accountability in South Africa. To illustrate the point further by providing examples, our courts are transparent in the conduct of proceedings. Judicial proceedings take place and decisions of the judges are delivered in open court. Unless special circumstances and the interests of justice are required, members of the public get to, the, to observe judicial authority at work. They can criticize the decisions of judges with reason. Litigants who are unhappy with the decision of judges have recourse to ask for an appeal. Litigants can come to court, expect a fair trial, and expect judges to consider their matters very carefully. Parties receive recent judgments, and those are made available to those who request them. Judges are public, judgments are public documents and available to all. Judgments of the Superior Courts are almost always published online on websites such as SAFI, that is the South African Information Legal Institute, or in various law reports which are useful in setting precedent or in guiding the public on how the courts view certain matters. We must emphasize that while the regulation of conduct of the judiciary through courts and other regulatory instruments is important, integrity is one of the hallmarks of the judiciary. It is included in the criteria of the selection of judges by the Judicial Service Commission or the JSC on what constitutes a fit and a proper person. As judges, we bring our own life experiences, our prejudices, our own notion, our beliefs and common sense to the process of judging, so do legal professionals. More emphasis should be placed on the value of integrity by all concerned in my view. I conclude with the following words by R.P.B. Davis. So members of the legal profession should feel no sense of smart satisfaction when they do the right thing and proper thing. For the most part, they do it without thinking because as members of that profession, they just cannot help themselves. Tradition sees that. And even when they have carefully to consider what is the ethically right thing to do, and when they deliberately then decide to follow the path of honor, they still have no reason to ascribe to themselves all the much merit. For most of what has already been said about can be brought down to a much lower plane than that of a high moral attitude. Honesty is the best policy. In the long run, it actually pays a barrister or an attorney that it should be known that he is scrupulously honorable. Would any say an honest person not rather put his affairs into the hands of a solicitor whom he knew to be completely reliable than into those of one who, no matter how able he might be, was not entirely to be trusted? Thank you very much.
uh, who is going to make the final input and then we'll open up um, for, for questions and discussions. Our final um, panelist is Professor Anton van Nickel, who is a distinguished professor of uh, philosophy and the director of the Center for Applied Ethics um, here at this university. It's an Afrikaans, I say, 
moraliteit mee te maken met die verschijnsel dat ons ons gedrag onderheerstel aan een behoorende scheids. Die vind maar samen met die moeder, die leren ons te doen. Een behoorende scheids. Dit is een mens ook. Fantastisch. Want die geeft het daar als een eis om te behoor. Die ontvangt ons daar een vraag dat daar behoor. This universe, all communities, all over the world, that I'm aware of, have that. That is what essentially distinguishes us from the animals. That's my first point. Second, leadership that is moral is therefore leadership that is primarily geared towards restoring and maintaining people's moral sense. That is their sense of right and wrong. This is also why moral education ought, as far as I'm concerned, to be part and parcel of all education. Not only in the humanities and social sciences where I come from, but also of the natural and applied sciences and already occurring at school level. I am involved a little bit in an organization called the Ethics Institute of South Africa. They are at the moment launching a huge project also to introduce uh, ethical structures and considerations at school level in South Africa. Maybe it will move further on in South Africa. You may ask me, is there any guarantee that to educate people morally will make them more better people? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, can we know that, that education will yield better people? Well, we, 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 we've seen, we've seen the opposite. We've seen the opposite so many. But then you say, moral education cannot guarantee a moral society and moral leadership, but it can help to equip the people better to argue morally, and it can prevent the lame excuse that we did not know what was the right thing to do. That is a pretty lame excuse, particularly as far as plagiarism is concerned. I hope none of you have even considered that terrible option, right? Don't even think about it. Right, let's go on to the third one. Leaders are accountable because they represent and lead communities. Well, Dublin is a community, Indrat is a community, Lydia is a community, the university is a community, the West Cape is a community, the country is a community. One is accountable, of course, first and foremost, in your individual capacity, but you are accountable to the community that places you in a position of responsibility, and whose interests are the sole purpose of your sojourn in a position of leadership. Leaders serve at the behest of their communities. And if they are no longer desired by that community, or if they violate the trust of that community, they must pack their things and get the hell out. That is the only uh, solution for a leader who does not have the trust of his community any longer. Fourth point. Accountability must be interpreted as functioning in what I would like to call the tension field between, on the one hand, autonomy and, on the other hand, licentiousness. To be accountable presupposes to be autonomous. That is, to be able to accept responsibility, that's what you are if you are autonomous, to use your own good sense to make independent choices. All those are the actions of autonomous agents, eh? But now, ladies and gentlemen, autonomy is not licentiousness or lawlessness. What an accountable leader must be able to see or to use his or her own good judgment. He or she can and must always be brought to account for or justify their decisions. Autonomy, which is essential for leadership, autonomy is not self-righteousness or high handedness. We must make those distinctions. Fifth one. Anybody know the manual comes? Where are my philosophy students? Ah, there, there they are. A uh, pretty, pretty impressive guy to read if you are interested in ethics. Hey? Now let me just make one point about Kant. Kant, uh, 18th century, very arguably the most, the most famous philosopher of the modern time. Kant's categorical imperative provides a good measure in terms of which to assess accountable leaders. Going to Kant, we should listen now to this. This is now a, a very important part of your education. 
For it not, we should act in such a way that we can always will to make the maxim according to which we act, that is simply the moral rule according to which we act, that we can make that rule a universal law or a universal rule to which any, anyone should adhere. You ask me, what is the secret of accountability? The categorical imperative is the secret of accountability. This is particularly what an accountable leader should be able to do. To show that the way in which he or she acted is the way that all responsible people should have been obliged to act in similar circumstances. If we apply this criterion, the criterion of the categorical imperative, Think about it then. What must we say of the relationship between Mr. Zuma and Mr. Shabi Sheikh? What must we say, much worse, of the building of Mukamla in its present stature? Was there acted upon a rule which could be universalized to be the rule according to which everybody else ought to act? If, if the answer to that is no, then we have to do with an immoral act. Immoral. Last point. An accountable leader, and this was also said by one of my distinguished uh, uh, panel colleagues, an accountable leader is self critical. Right? Someone who is not always on the offensive, but who admits his or her failures, and more importantly, who seeks criticism and who responds constructively to criticism. Although this point is essential, it is, unfortunately, maybe too much to ask. Right? Maybe, oh, there, one of the only leaders while I was writing this up this afternoon that I could think of who really responded constructively eventually to criticism and kind of reinvented himself was Bill Clinton. Right? Bill Clinton. That's, that's in, in, in his midterm. But unfortunately, at the beginning of the second term, he was awakened upon by Miss Monica Lewis. <laughs> We should rather entrench institutions that guarantee society's right to criticize. That's, that's my final point. Yes, leaders must be, if they are accountable, they must be open to criticism. They must be willing to reassess their own actions and find themselves out of view. But if they ask me too much, and I'm afraid, for most of them, it is probably asking too much. Then at least, we must have institutions in society that entrench our right to criticism. The correct question to ask in the is not who should go. That's the wrong question. The correct question is how do we protect ourselves against bad government? That's the correct uh, question to ask. And that can only do by means of institutions like the freedom of the press, like an independent judiciary, uh, like uh, freedom of assembly, and all the other fundamental human rights that we have, to entrench the right to criticism. Then, hopefully, we will eventually have a proper democracy in South Africa. Thank you very much.
ask, if you ask a question, you just ask the question. Decide if you want to make a statement or you want to ask a question. Because people who would ask a question then answer them. And I don't know, I don't know what we must do then if you ask a question and you answer them yourself. So decide if you want to answer them. Let's uh, take up that first question. Second question. Let's take the second question first. Let's take the three and then there's the. Can we move the mic to here? Can the person at the back uh, try and uh, and speak whilst the mic is coming? Of making anything compulsory for students. 
It's a bad idea. The, the, the times that it has been tried, it did not work. You're showing a lot of people who don't want to be there, and that's the last thing you want in philosophy class. Let me, let me assure you. So, um, your, your question was, what role can philosophy of which ethics is done in a subdiscipline, what can it play in terms of the of the awareness out there in society? And it's actually a considerably more difficult question than you might, you might think yourself. I try to allude to it a little bit by saying uh, I think it is of value, I think it can help people to at least uh, be accountable, first of all, to themselves in terms of how ethical argumentation works and better accountable towards others. They can participate better in moral discussions that ought to take place, not only here at university, but in the workplace, in factories, in businesses, or in churches, or, 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 or all over the place. So they can be better uh, accountable in that sense. But whether the teaching of the subject as such is actually going to make a significant uh, difference. Many people argue that ethics is not taught. They say ethics is caught. <laughs> and that means you, you catch it when you are young, in your, in, your, in your home, in your church, from your teachers, from your friends and stuff. Yeah? Ethics is not taught, it's caught. Let me make a last remark uh, about this. And that is to say, uh, what is essential? Now I'm addressing myself to all the people who are not studying in the humanities but also in the natural and applied sciences. It is essential when you are studying engineering, when you are studying medicine, when you are studying agriculture, it is essential to be made aware of the moral dimensions of all those subjects. Just think of the ecological impact of agriculture and engineering. Eh? Just, uh, we are also a little bit busy in those faculties. So, so moral education must not be an add-on, I always say, to you know, actually doing your science, but it has to be an integral part of, uh, of, of, of how a subject is taught. And I'm happy to say, at least at this university, this is increasingly happening. I'm very heartened by it. Probably not enough yet, but I think we can work. Thank you.
I mean, that is an op- absolute nightmare, an absolute nightmare. So, if something like that happens, you are in serious trouble. Uh, because, you know, they've already written their exams, you can't expect them to write it again. Now. On what basis? And I often ask myself, how would I, how would I act in such a situation? Well, what else can you do but be honest about it, uh, exert beforehand, every possible measure to try and prevent it. But I mean, if you have a pack of scripts in the back of your car and they steal your car, uh, then, then, you know, then, then you have a problem. You play all the cards, accept the responsibility, don't shirk the responsibility, accept it. And uh, uh, the Afrikaans writer, C.J. Langenhofer, said the best way to get out of trouble is to go right through. Always remember, the best way to get out of trouble is to go right through.
coercion by different construction companies uh, around the building of the 2010 World Cup stadiums. Now there's now, there's a case in the court of law dealing with that. So, you know, the first and foremost, um, that's how I would define, and that's how it's defined, is, is when you are actually um, uh, accepting a bribe unlawfully. However, there is also a personal, a personal platform that you can move on. Is when in your and, and I think I, I like what Professor Zanikak has said is that ethics is not taught but it's taught. Um, I think there's a there's a, um, a underlying foundation about how you've grown up that um, that puts you in that situation. And uh, you know I've often asked myself when I'm invited to a suite at Newlands, am I am I in a position to be bright? Just think about that. Because big companies, it's a question that I've asked myself many occasions. My wife works for a company and she designs food products. And one of the food products you have to prepare on the Weber. So I said to her, why don't you phone Weber and tell them that you need this Weber at home because you're preparing your food and it goes on the back of the label there's cooking instructions, prepare it on the web. Otherwise, I have to buy a web. <laughs> and she said she's not allowed to. She received a gift the other day. She visited an abattoir and she was given a pillow. And when she got home, she said, I'm not sure if I, if I did the right thing. I received this pillow um, at the end of the tour and I, I'm not sure if they really expect me to have a 10 out of 10 for this abattoir. And she, she had to go and speak to her boss the next day. She declared that she got a pillow and asked the boss, and it's a pillow that you just put on your lounge uh, suite. I mean, it's nothing serious, no big money, but it's, there's also a different level of how you think about having a right. And I think that comes from within, and that's why I, I really like what Professor Fabian said in terms of you know, talk to court, it's, it's two different things. The other thing is, um, from a personal point of view, and this is something that I had to, that I really had to teach myself, because I, when I was as young as you were, and even a young lecturer at this university, you know, you're very arrogant, and you can never make a mistake. And I had to teach myself to listen to people who ask, and allow them to ask me questions, to get into a position where I can criticize myself. And, and I think uh, Professor Fadika also referred to that, I think it was his last point, is that leaders need to be put themselves in that position where if you stand for a leader, the first thing that you've got to ask yourself is, am I prepared to be criticized? Am I prepared to actually ask someone to ask me the nasty questions? And, and what in, in, in my experience is that when you're humble and when you realize that you're just a human being that they do make mistakes, when it's impossible for me to go through this day without making a mistake, I either lose my temper or uh, you know, I kick the dog. So once you get into that position where you, where you actually realize you're just a human being, that it makes mistakes numerous times a day. I think that's, but that's also a personal thing. And I'd like to conclude with, last year there was a South African referee that blew the match between Australia and New Zealand, in Australia. New Zealand, at that stage, had won 17 times on the drop. If they won one more game, they would have had the world record. That record is jointly held by South Africa under Nikki and by the previous All Black team under Graham Henry. So they, they, and this is a great All Black team. So I think it was in their time of the match, there was a scrum, and as we all know, the scrums are horrendous. The, the refs don't know how to blow it, but he blew it and he, and he gave a penalty to Australia. They kicked the goal, and it was a tell. And New Zealand did not have 18 wins on a drop. 
and it was all over. You know what he did in the week after that? He went to Steve Hansen and Richie McCall and he said to them, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And you know what they did? They said, that's okay, that's all that we wanted. But we don't want someone who denies. The red one's fine. We just want you to acknowledge that you've made a mistake. And I think if, from a personal point of view, if we can all get to that, to that stage, you earn so much respect. You earn respect. You don't deserve respect. If you make a mistake and you acknowledge, you earn respect. If you don't do that, you want to deserve respect. And I think that's the difference between the two. Thank you. I know your generation that often just do what you feel like 
and not against the Jewish life thing. I also want to encourage you, and I encourage myself with this as well, to do, do it while life is easy. Yes, I know it's tough now with academics, but do the ethical thing now while life is easy. So when we leave, that will be our character. And when the pressure is on, that will just be our natural instinct. So from my side, um, thank you so much for coming. I hope to see a lot of your faces and further discussions. Thank you so much for making this um, event. Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing your insight and hope to see you soon and also to hear about more from you. Um, there's so many